made possible through the support of our generous sponsors. The Talk of Painesville, a Painesville Area Community Education production in association with the Painesville Area Chamber of Commerce. I'm Jacob Bertram, and thank you for joining us live today. Please enter your questions at any time during the broadcast, and we'll try to get them into the show. On the show today, we have our State Senator, Jeff Howe, and State Representative, Lisa Damon. And of course, you can't forget about our Joke of the Week, Chamber's Spotlight, and your Meg Wealth Management Money Minute. We want to welcome our first guest today, Minnesota Representative Lisa Damoth and Minnesota Senator, Senator Jeff Howe. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Good morning, Jacob. Good morning. Great to be with you. Well, Senator Howe, we'll start with you. Um, please give us an update on what's you know happening now with the COVID-19 in the Senate and how Senate members are forced to to change up their, their daily sessions. Well, our daily sessions are quite unique now. And instead of uh, everybody being in the chamber and everyone voting quite different now everyone's in different areas we're all social distancing you have uh, some folks that uh, may have underlying health conditions or and are concerned they actually now can vote from home they can actually phone in their vote to the uh, uh have it counted so they have taken it quite serious, as we should, and we've uh, adapted our rules to make that happen and allow them to, been, to work through this pandemic and, and make sure they can we can still represent our districts and the people that that we uh, were elected by to to make sure that their voice is heard down here as far as the bills that we're moving through. And so it's it's unique. It's different. Uh, I just, uh, I've made sure that I've, I come down here and actually finger on the button instead of going through my vote, but, but not everybody has that opportunity and not everyone can, in these circumstances can make that happen. But it's, it's pretty unique. It's going to be different to go back to the same rules that we once had now that we've done this this way. Uh, I'm looking forward to and everyone and it's it's very difficult to actually work a bit uh, in this process because you can't sit down with everyone in one room you're making multiple phone calls trying to do it through zoom or through net meeting and uh it's, it's a new challenge representative damoth will ask the same question how are things uh in this house there's a lot of things that are the same, Jacob, as what Senator Howe has mentioned. Um, the House being 134 members, there's a lot more of us that have to adjust um, and be accommodated for. Um, we also can vote and participate in floor sessions remotely. I have chosen to um, attend in St. Paul, whether in another room in the Capitol from my office in the state office building or actually on the floor. I've um, chosen to attend that way for every one of our sessions except for one. Uh, just a couple nights ago, we had a session that was only 21 minutes long. We knew there weren't any bills up for hearing, and I chose to stay back here in district in Cold Spring and participate remotely. It's really interesting. I know the Senate can go in and push their own button when it's time to vote. The House doesn't have that option. So the last few times that we've met, we um, on the GOP side have had the option of having up to 12 of our members on the floor or normally we would have many more. Um, and we're spread out throughout the, the right side of the chamber, um, back in the alcove, um, over in the side. When it comes, comes time to vote though, we are all doing that by voice, whether people are on the phone calling in and there's a procedure that we use um, saying our last name. And when the roll is taken, we say our last name, where we're calling from or where we are and then that we're present. When it comes time for a vote, then we say our last name and then either um, yes or no on the vote. So, so it's Brent, um, it, we're accommodating things just like the rest of our state, um, the rest of our world, but it is different and it's um, a little bit more difficult to 
like Senator House said, it's a little bit more difficult where we can't all be in the same room and discussing things and hearing from each other. It takes a little bit more time, but we're making it work. It's great to hear. Well, Representative Damoth, as a business owner, how has the governor's executive orders affected you and your business, and what do you think the state should be doing to help small businesses through this t challenging time? That, that's a really good question, Jacob. Thank you. Um, our business that we own is commercial leased property, and so the tenants that I have right now, um, I have two that are open one that it has been shut down and even though we don't own those personally um, it's affecting obviously their income or lack of um, one of the businesses that is in our building has chosen to put all of their employees on remote so they're uh, paying their lease like they should um, and that's what we're encouraging all business um, renters to do all renters of property when possible um, to make sure that they're paying their their payments as expected but it's a challenge so there's a lot of options out there both on the federal side for small businesses but then also on the state we're going to be hearing in the house later this afternoon after this interview um, i'll be heading in for session we're going to be hearing about maybe some provisions for small businesses but as long as those businesses are working with their lenders and figuring out what they apply what they qualify for and getting those applications in it's going to make our businesses solid or a little bit more solid during this very very difficult Senator Howe, uh, this question is for you. The state has gone from a projected $1.5 billion surplus to now projected $2.4 billion deficit. What does this mean for your average Minnesotan? Uh, well, it's a big shift. And uh, some of the things that we were going to do, uh, we had planned to do a, a tax cut for Social Security and exempt that completely. Uh, we won't be able to do that. That would have been a $400 million adjustment and give back to the senior citizens of our state. That will not happen. We just don't have the money. Uh, there's some other tax cuts we won't be able to do. Uh, it will be a big shift. It, there are going to be some tight times. Uh, we, we come back if uh, with the economy shut down, we, the... Uh, the tax revenue will just not be there. So we will be looking when we come back next year, we will be having to make cuts in a lot of areas that this is going to hurt. There's not going to be a, a, any segment of our uh, of our populations that's not going to bear some of this burden on, on trying to get out of this uh, economic hold of the head. It is fortunate that we have a rainy day fund, big uh, reserve, but we're not, I, I'm not in support of using that whole uh, reserve to try and get ourselves out. I think we need to, to take some of that and uh, keep that just in case uh, we continue in this and it takes longer for us to get out of the cold than uh, what we what we think it's going to take. It. So it's it's all based on how fast our economy comes back, how fast we open up and let our businesses open up, and how many of those do and how many are shuttered for good and how many jobs we lose. So it's, it's all relative. Uh, it'll be, be really based on what comes out in that next February forecast where we go from there. And so it's, it's key to getting people back to opening up fast as we do this safely, of course, because we got to worry about the health of our patients. It doesn't, hurt. It doesn't help us any if everybody we got to do this in a safe manner. But uh, uh, the key is, is is how fast things move, how, how quickly we can get back together. But there won't be a segment of our economy that doesn't feel this. Uh, some of the programs, everything that, that take that is going to suffer. All right, well, this question is for both of you, and we'll start with uh, Representative Damoth. Um, do you think that the governor will extend the stay-at-home order past the May 18th end time? Um, I hope not, <laughs> um, to be honest with you. I don't know whether or not he will do that, um, but we can see from the data that we have been shown at this point that the concerns right now 
are with our long-term care and congregate living settings. That's where the highest numbers of uh, people that have passed away from COVID-19 are. And so when we look at our entire state, we have other areas that the population is much more concentrated then again, like those long-term care facilities, if we can put more of our energy into those areas, into the most vulnerable population, I think that's a better way to go on this, Jacob. Um, and then making sure that people within the rest of the state and outside, if you're sick, obviously stay home. That's been a huge thing that's been talked about. And it's a really important lesson that we all need to take to heart. If you're not feeling well, stay home. And then also if you have underlying health conditions or if there's, um, in another way that you might be of either an age or more vulnerable, use caution with that. I know my parents are a little bit older, but still active. I've done a little bit of picking things up for them. They've been cautious as they go out. It's gone on a long time and people are getting um, getting tired of it. But I think the safety that we put in those first two weeks um, made complete sense to me. Extending it a little bit longer, I understood. Now I think it's going on a little bit too long for the entire state in the same way that we've been So the next question here is, um, are either of you concerned about the extraordinary measures the governor has been taking during this crisis? You know, I, I think that uh, we, we, he, we need to take a look at those, uh, ex his executive powers. I, I do believe that uh, what he did at the beginning was, was right. But I do believe that that the way it works right now is is if the if once he extends he starts with five days and then he can extend them with his with his uh, uh, I think it's his executive council and for another thirty days and any time when that when we're in session uh, it takes both the House and the Senate it takes both chambers to re. To decide to stop those. Uh, in fact, if one of those decides to that to override and say it's done, and the other one uh, doesn't take up the measure, the the orders continue. And I believe that that both chambers should have to prove extending it uh, instead of both chambers deciding that it has to remove the. So I think that's a change that needs to come in the future. Uh, but right now, uh, I w the only thing I'll say is I wish that the governor would work with the legislature and allow us to work with him. I, I think it's a, a mistake to have him uh, make all the decisions and carry all the burden on this. I think it should, would be more appropriate to work with the legislature instead of all always just asking for our money. That's all he's been waiting for is the appropriation. Once he gets the appropriation, he doesn't talk to us. And I think that's a mistake. I think that, uh, and I truly believe the emergency is, is over. Uh, not the crisis, but I do believe that we should get back to letting the legislature actually work the bills and take them to the governor and work with us and, and let us be part of the solution here instead of carrying the burden all of them. Representative Damoth, any thoughts on that? I agree with the Senator. I would like to see the governor working more with the legislature. We're three co-equal branches of government and I think um, now would be the time to start working together on solutions. I think that's what Minnesotans are looking for and um, I hope that that can happen soon. Well, so many people right now just want to know when will life be back to normal? When will we be able to go outside and, and enjoy our, our summer and springtime activities that we always been used to? So uh, do you have any idea of when this kind will be back to normal? Well, we're all hoping to get back to normal sooner than later, but I don't know if that's going to happen as we'd like. Uh, you know, that's a question right now uh, only the governor can answer, and I don't know when that's when, what his thought process is. I'm I'm hopeful that that it happens uh, fairly soon. But the nor the new normal is going to be quite different for us until we work through this and get a handle on exactly what we're working. With. Uh, 
I think the data is coming in that, that this is a very contagious virus and it's very uh, deadly for those who have underlying health conditions. But uh, for the normal population, it seems like it's uh, not as deadly as what we first had thought. So I, I, I do believe that, that uh, hopefully we can get back to a new normal uh, sooner than later and it's gonna help everybody with mental health conditions, uh, you know, we, I, I truly would like to see what our, what the conditions are, and, and those folks that are suffering with uh, mental health conditions, the suicides, the domestic violence. I'd like to see the numbers and what that had an uptick, and maybe we need to put more services out there to help. I, I, I'm really concerned that those that segment of our population that need those services have been neglected during this period of time. And that, that that concerns me, that we don't have the data and the information to, to put programs and get those services out to the public. Truly concerned that that can For both of you, any thoughts on um, the election this fall and if that would be, if they still would have the election or other ways of having that uh, absentee ballot voting in or, or, or different ways of um, delaying the election. I'll let you go take that first. Please. Absolutely. Um, you know, we in Minnesota have the option of um, absentee ballot. Um, you said we can we can vote absentee. That's something that we can look at. As far as doing mail-in ballots, which is something that has been talked about by some segments of the population, I don't agree with that. I don't think mail-in ballots are the way to go. Um, there are ways that we can keep people safe. Our polling places um, may not be in the same places that they have been before. A lot of times those are located in schools or in nursing home facilities. Um, we did in the House just put through a bill earlier this week that allows the deadline to be extended of where our polling places can be um, located. Usually you have to determine that by the end of December of 19. We've extended that through July just not knowing exactly what this is going to look like as the summer and fall moves forward. And so there's been some provisions that have um, been made also dollars allocated to make our polling places a little bit safer too, whether that's cleaning, whether that's shields, whatever that actually looks like. So there's some things that have been put in place um, and are going down the line to make our our election, our voting process safer. Well, I know both of you are very busy people and I'm going to be respectful for your time. So if there's anything else you'd like to add, um, I'm out of questions now, uh, but if there's any final words or any statements you'd like to add. Um, absolutely, Jacob. Thank you for this opportunity. I think um, this, the talk of Painesville, the collaboration between the chamber and community ed is just another great way to see how people are taking this time and doing something different and meeting the needs of pain of Painesville, the surrounding community, and then as we're helping each other. I know Senator Howe had alluded to the concern over mental health. I want to not leave on a hard note, but I know sometimes people, their homes are not the safest place to be. And in that case, you don't have to stay home. So anybody that's facing a challenging time within the home that they're located, they need to reach out to law enforcement and um, and get the help that they need also for that mental health piece. I know we have people that are not able to work right now and that puts on a financial stress onto families. And then I think of all of those um, parents that have been thrown into the homeschooling um, or schooling from home helping their kids and that can bring a whole level of stress. So I would encourage people to find a way to help somebody else, to encourage someone else. And if you need to step outside, it's sunny out today, step outside, get a breath of fresh air, and then attack it. I know I have two um, grandkids that are being homeschooled by our daughter, um, distance learning, and one of them said, I'm not, I don't really like mom school every day, so it can be a little harder. But as we are facing our new normal and still in this unsure time, uh, we need to just keep doing that what we can. Thanks again for the opportunity, and I look forward to watching future episodes of the Talk Feeds Show. You know, this is Representative Damis is right. This is a this is a great opportunity, a great program. I didn't know about before. I will be dialing in and listening in uh, in the future. I 
didn't realize that this existed. I think of more communities who do something like this. Uh, I will say that that uh, there's a lot of concerns out there, and I've been talking to a lot of constituents. Keep sending that information in. It, it's great ideas. It's great information, and we can use that down here. And, and listening to the, the you folks out there, it, it, that's the way we learn things. That's the way we understand how this affects everyone. It affects everyone a little bit different, and we can take those ideas and help us craft la uh, language the legislation down here. Uh, that's important. And we go home on the 18th. Uh, seriously, we will be back sometime in June. Uh, but that information that you get up there to give us is invaluable in how this process don't hesitate to either pick up the phone or send us an email or a text. It's uh, it's great stuff. We look forward to using that and connecting. A lot of thanks to both of you for what you do for our state and for our community. And so thank you, Senator Howe and Representative Damuth, for joining us today. And we'll now to pay some bills and support our sponsors. Thank you for joining us. We all want to be centered on life's best moments, the big ones, the small ones. We know you don't have time for complicated banking, and we believe you deserve something more. Our friendly and knowledgeable team is here to make banking easier with the right financial accounts, loans, and services to fit your needs. It's our promise to you to place your needs at the center of all we do. Central Minnesota Credit Union, centered on you. We want to welcome Mr. Jeremy Wilner for this episode's Your Money Minute. Thank you, Jacob, and good morning. This is Jeremy Wilner, CEO and founder of MagWealth Management with offices in Painesville and Wilmer. And today we're going to get back to the basics and talk about 12 tips for improving financial well being, reducing debt, and increasing net worth. Tip number one is maintain a budget at every stage in life. Budgeting is very important and it's a great way to stay on a financial course. So don't try to deviate from that budget and maintain as much as you can with that budget. Tip two is evaluate your spending needs versus your wants. And this just goes hand in hand with the budget. You wanna always look at what you're spending and to see is it a need or is it a want? Tip three is engage a financial coach. And what we're talking about here is just like a workout buddy, you wanna have a financial buddy someone to be accountable and to make sure that you stay on track. Tip four is to pay yourself first. When we talk about paying yourself first, we're talking about saving money for yourself first. Then you pay your bills and then look at what's left over at the end and perhaps spend that. Tip five is identify and prioritize your goals. So what are your goals? What do you wanna get out of life? Where do you see yourself in 5, 10, 15, 20 years? What are your retirement goals? Prioritize those goals and start building a plan toward them. Tip six is understanding why today's money is more valuable than tomorrow's money. And what we're talking about here is the rule of 72. So if I have a dollar amount that I invest and I earn a 7.2% return, it will double in 10 years. So starting today, my money could potentially double in 10 years if I earn a 7.2% return. So today's money is worth much more. Tip seven is never leave money on the table. What we talk about here is, is a person's retirement plan that they have at work. Do you have a 401k, a 403b, a simple IRA, and the employer matches? Make sure that you're contributing what you need to to get that full match. Tip eight is to diversify your financial life. So in investments, don't just invest in one sector or category. Look to diversify, and that may also include real estate and other alternative investments. Tip number nine is to know your tolerance for risk versus your appetite for risk. And we have a great uh, uh, risk tolerance questionnaire that's out on our website that can get you an immediate response, and there are other ones. Ones on other websites. 
tolerance for risk is versus your appetite. And your tolerance is what you actually can handle, where your appetite is what you want to handle with your risk. Tip 10 is don't finance anything that doesn't appreciate. And what we're really talking about here is your credit card debt. Look to pay that off if you can every month. And if you need to carry a balance, make sure that you're paying much more than the minimum and to try to reduce that debt as quickly as possible. Tip number 11 is the automate, automate, automate. So we're really talking about savings again here is to automate that process so that savings comes out first, just like you can set up all of your payments or your debt to be automatic, make sure you have that savings be automatic, automatic as well. And then finally, tip 12, adopt a positive attitude about money. Money is just the tool to help you get what you want out of life and to not be scared of it and to have and maintain a budget and to follow these tips will help you get on the right path. So where can you learn more? You can visit our website at magwealth.com. You can send me an email at jwilner at magwealth.com or you can give us a phone call and we have the complete guide out on our website. Thank you very much everyone and have a great day. Back to you, Jacob. Money. Thanks, Jeremy. We'll see you next week. If you have any questions you would like to ask Jeremy, please put them in the comment section below and we'll get them in the future broadcast. If you'd like to com contact Jeremy directly for more information about what he talked about today, please go to his website at www.megwealth.com. And now, the moment we all have been waiting for, at least I have, get ready for this week's Joke of the Week. <laughs> Here we go, the first one of this week. What did the big chimney say to the little chimney? You're too young to smoke. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Calm down. Okay, I got more of where that came from. Uh, where does the polar bear keep his money? In the snowbank. Yeah, that's another one. That's another one. <laughs> All right, this one comes from our sponsor, m m Lumber, all the way in m m Lumber. Want to hear a joke about construction? I'm still working on it. <laughs> uh, three for three, I got three laughs now. Okay, here we go, the last one here. How does a penguin build its house? It, it glues it together. Oh, I, oh, okay, that's fine. I guess I get those boos. I just have to do it. All right, well, thank you for tuning in to this week's Joke of the Week. We'll be right back. This program is made possible through the support of our generous sponsors. The Talk of Painesville, a Painesville Area Community Education production in association with the Painesville Area Chamber of Commerce. We all want to be centered on life's best moments. The big ones, the small ones. We know you don't have time for complicated banking. And we believe you deserve something more. Our friendly and knowledgeable team is here to make banking easier with the right financial accounts, loans, and services to fit your needs. It's our promise to you Place your needs at the center of all we do. Central Minnesota Credit Union, centered on you. Painesville Area Chamber of Commerce, Member Spotlight. Lumber's your lumber yard, hardware store, paint department, and rental center all rolled into one convenient location. Their operation includes numerous departments staffed with knowledgeable personnel who are able to assist with material estimates, product selection, provide tips to make your project go more smoothly. Stop by M&M Lumber today.
Just located downtown Painesville, Perennial Bank has been serving the community for more than 100 years. Just as it was back then, it is still providing leadership skills in today's banking community. Visit their website for more information at perennialbank.com. If you'd like to make an investment in your community, please consider joining the Painesville Area Chamber of Commerce today. More information about joining can be found at www.painesvillechamber.org. While you're at the Chamber website, you can click on the Bingo Board tab and support our local businesses by filling out a Bingo Board. You can win a $25 prize. Right folks, that's all that we have today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jacob Bertram. Stay home, stay safe, and stay cool, Painesville.